Or you get a flat tire. Before I could even get the jack out, a state trooper came by. And my first, like, gut reaction was, oh crap, what did we do wrong? We're about to get a ticket now on top of this. And I was totally wrong. And then, at some point in this, one of the state troopers says to me, just kind of surprised, you know how to change the tire? Oh, well, the last couple that I stopped and helped on the side of the road, the guy didn't know what he was doing, so he sat in the passenger seat and the girl was changing the tire. It's not that I want to teach guys how to change tires, although I'm happy to do that. It has more to teach them why they could want to change the tire in the first place. Well, hello, and welcome back to the Be Unbound podcast. I'm your co-host, David Rethemeyer. And I'm your co-host, Jonathan Brush. And we are back with another episode of our Extraordinary and Ordinary series, where we interview people that chances are pretty good that you have never heard of these people. And this is the case. We are interviewing a young man who has been an alumni of Unbound and by all accounts is a seemingly very ordinary individual. But we think that he has some pretty extraordinary ideas that, especially in our culture today, it might surprise you a little bit to hear from somebody his age. Oh, this is a fun interview. And I'll do a little correction. I said... Keen's not been in the Be Unbound podcast before, but in fact, he has been. He was in as part of a group we interviewed earlier who had done a really interesting series on freedom, and we had Keen as part of that. So he is a returning guest to the Be Unbound podcast, but I hope you enjoy our conversation with Keen Bishop. Well, Keen, welcome to the Be Unbound podcast. Keen is a long-term not guests in the podcast, but certainly a guest for conversations with me, with David, often with David and I together. So we have the distinct honor and privilege of knowing Kean. First coming into Unbound as a student, and what is it, Kean, like three years ago or something like that? So showed up at our events. We'd never met him before. Since then, this has never happened before, but I've been in South Dakota at least twice. And recently, I had an interesting experience where some of you who are longtime listeners of the podcast remember Abraham Chen, who got married not that long ago. And I was coming to that wedding, and as I was leaving to go to the wedding, my flight got canceled. And as I was scrambling to rebook that flight, I had problems doing that. It wasn't working out. And so Kean's texting me and says, hey, because Kean was going to pick me up at the airport because I was already coming in at some terrible hour of the night in Sioux Falls. And Kean's like, you can go to CMO or some other airport code. And so I'm oh, working. Yeah, so I'm working with Megan trying to get that rebooked. And I told Megan, Kean says I can fly here. So we booked the flight. And I'm like, okay, I'm reset. And I'm like, I wonder what that code is. I don't know that code. And I look at it, it's OMA, yes, and it's OMA. And I was like, Omaha? And I was like, man, I'm not a Midwestern guy, but I didn't know that Omaha was close to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So I whip up my trusty Google Maps. I was like, Omaha is not close to <laughs> Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So I called Keen. I said, did you say Omaha? And he's like, yeah. I was like, dude, that's like three and a half hours away. He's like, yeah, no problem. I was like, I don't get in until 1230. He's like, I do this all the time. So, so I landed in Omaha, Nebraska, two states away from where I was supposed to go. This was just a couple of weeks ago. Kian is sitting there with a borrowed car and another friend of ours and picks us up. And we had an interesting trip back across. Kian drove fine. But I got to tell you, Kian, we had a really fascinating conversation for that last hour and a half. And I know it must have been awesome. And I remember talking, but I don't know the foggiest idea we talked about anymore. But so anyhow, so Kian's part of all kinds of adventures here at Unbound. And this is a bit of an adventure, too, because Kian... As we record this, it'll have happened by the time you listen to it. It's about to be married in what, three days, Keen? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, June 22nd. All right. And this is June 19th. So, so we're right before the wedding. So, Keen, how in the world did you land yourself getting interrogated on this podcast by David and I? Well, it's, it's funny you asked that. You said a distinct honor and privilege of knowing me. I don't think that I would quite put it in that category, but I'm, I'm glad <laughs> someone feels that way. It's Midwestern you know, I, modesty right there. South Dakota <laughs> modesty. So getting involved with Unbound, I guess, probably starts with homeschooling because it seems like we have a pretty healthy population of homeschoolers in, in Unbound. And that started on and off all through childhood, probably part of just moving around a lot. That's kind of where my dad's work took us. And then somewhere in there, I, well, my, my grandpa was a pilot, so I really wanted to fly. And that ended up not working out for reasons that you guys know about. I think that, I think that the reasons for that had to do with damage to the structural components of the airplane, possibly related to Kean, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that, that's, that's about right. It's, it's funny that I, this all comes up again, because I took Perrin out to that airport just 
what was it, Sunday? We were out in that area, and they went and replaced all the stuff on the plane, but they left the damaged elevator there. And every time I see it sitting in the airport, I, I kind of get a wild harebrained idea to stick it in a box and mail it to you uh, with zero <laughs> context whatsoever. <laughs> So, if I got a damaged elevator from a cub, I would know where it came from. It doesn't yeah. matter what the markings would be on the box. So, yeah, yeah. That, I'd probably have a really random return address that wouldn't line up with me at all. But yeah, so that, yeah, Flirt School ended up kind of taking a dive and Unbound was nice. the backup plan that I didn't actually want to do really at all. I was pretty defiant going into Apex, I'm not going to lie. I didn't want to like it. But... Just as a side note. I've been doing this a long time, and there are certain young males who show up at Apex with a defiant look in their eye, and, and there's two ways that this normally goes. Either they don't really last, they don't even make it to base camp, which happens occasionally, or they end up becoming the absolute favorite people that we have in the program. And I absolutely saw the defiance in Kean's eye when he came in. I was like, well, we're going to see where this one goes. And I wasn't really sure, but at the end of base camp, I think this one's going to make it. And uh, yeah, and, and, there, and there was a whole crew of them. I think that Colton and some others were mm -hmm. in that same camp. And so we had a pretty, pretty interesting crop that year. So, well, Keen, you came into Unbound accidentally because of a damage to an airplane and defiantly and, and and seems like you've done pretty well in the program. We've certainly enjoyed having you. But professionally, you are in the trades. And so tell us a little bit about what you do for a living. Yeah, so... What I do for a living is kind of interesting right now. It's not not exactly what I want to do forever, but I've been doing it for a while now, and, and I'd say getting decent at it. But basically, I, I work for a pretty small company here in Sioux Falls, and we do a lot of house flips for residential, you know, some single family, some multifamily, but some Airbnb. We we kind of do all of that. So it, it's been an interesting experience in the trades because I've gotten to experience all of the trades kind of at once. So that's, that's what I'm doing right now. I have been tinkering with different ideas, but yeah, the trades is where I started when I was 12 or 13 now started just picking up trash on a job site and stuck with that for a few years, ended up doing more and then switched companies, switched companies again, and been around the trade scene in the greater Sioux Falls area. So yeah, that's a little bit about what I do. And so I think that puts you in a kind of interesting category and not so much, I mean, anymore trades are kind of a bit of a rarity. And so that's not so much the interesting category, but it's put you in a category of people that have experienced a pretty big cross section of different folks, right? So you've hung out with the unbound crowd. You came up through homeschool co-op. I think you did classical conversations, if I remember correctly. So I would say Key in, in our, all of our conversations is a significantly well-educated, classically educated person. In the trades, you work with a whole lot of people and all ends of the economic spectrum. And so done that, and you've done that in several different layers in terms of working for different aspects of construction and things like that. But there's a story that I was thinking about that might kick off some of our discussion here. And that is that, so you mentioned Perrin, that's your fiance, uh, soon to be wife in three days hence. And Perrin's from Mississippi, also an Unbound student, that's how they met. And at one point you were traveling with Perrin in Mississippi. I think you guys had a flat tire and you got out and changed the flat tire and had some interactions with Mississippi's finest. I don't know if it was Mississippi or it was one of those Southern states. And you had an interesting conversation with a state trooper. And do you remember that you texted me about that? Yes. And you were kind of, it, it kind of got you fired up about something. And so recount that story for me a little bit. And then we, can, we might be able to, to launch off of that into some interesting discussion. So, yeah, I was visiting Perrin, we were driving about an hour out to her, some land that her family owns out there, just because she wanted to show it to me. There was like an old house out there and we just wanted to go check it out. I hadn't seen it before, but I just heard stories. So we were in there, kind of a family beater, you know, farm truck and got a, got a flat tire. And so- Now, hold on. We just, we guys, we just pause the search show right there. Kean says that like his truck wouldn't be the same category, right? I oh, mean, like, mine is so way exactly, worse. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, like, well, when you say family beater farm truck, I just want the audience to know that's like a significant step up from what Kean typically drives as his truck. So, okay, I just, just having ridden in Kean's truck, I just wanted to, for, for farm trucks everywhere, I wanted to sort of lay that in context. All right, continue, Kean. So. Yeah, I, I actually did a collective uh, net worth assessment of different, like, hard assets and the tools and guns in my truck 
triple the value of it. <laughs> so, oh, I have no doubt. The that's stuff that right. poked, <laughs> Yeah, the stuff that poked me in the ribs when I got into the airport to Sioux Falls several years ago were totally worth more than the truck. But okay, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, we get a flat tire. I don't remember exactly what caused the flat tire, but it, it the tire was pretty shot. It was dry rotten. It, it was so funny because it was before I could even get the jack out and start getting the tire up, uh, a state trooper came by. Um, I, I, I am very pro law enforcement, but my first like gut reaction was, oh crap, what did we do wrong? We're about to get a ticket now on top of this. And I was totally wrong. The I think, state trooper I was think, super I nice. think what they call that, yeah, I think they call that a guilty conscience. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that the, the word for that is guilty conscience. It's yeah. probably fair, but super nice state trooper. At the end of that, being three of them that came by to observe and help and whatever, because I guess they were bored Which, which that I day. think is a, well, I just think that's a really, that's a fantastic reflection of Mississippi state troopers. I it mean, was, you break it down was. And, and before you get another tire on, it's not like you've never changed a tire before. So it's not like it's taking you a long time. You get three of Mississippi's finest to stop by and ask to help you. I think that's pretty cool, actually. Either that or they were all really bored and they were all just like, hey, there's something interesting happening right over here. <laughs> that I did look suspicious, that David. may it's, have it's been it. Yeah. Awesome. You know, the first one stopped and we, we had a jack, but, you know, it's a crummy little scissor jack that comes right. in. Right. under the seat of whatever year F-150 this was. And so I was working with that and this, it was a lady that stopped first and she said, oh, well, you know, I think that somebody else in the area probably has a, a better jack. So let me, you know, call them and see how far away they are. So I just keep on working on it. And before I know it, a minute later, somebody else shows up with a floor jack in the back of their squad car. And I was like, well, sweet, this will be even faster now. Like, and keep in mind, this is all taken like, you know, our scissor jack is not the most efficient way to lift the truck, right. but it, it doesn't right. take that long. So this right. has all happened within a couple dozen cranks of a scissor jack. So I don't know how close these people were to each other or how fast they were willing to drive that day. But anyway, we, we're just shooting the breeze, chatting while I'm lifting this tire up. And at some point in this, this one of the state troopers says to me, just kind of surprised, you know how to change the tire and i was like well i was like borderline offended i'm like yeah like i don't want to change the tire like that can't be that hard right and she goes oh well you must not be from around here and she looks at perrin with kind of a funny look of like where did he find him you know and she makes a off-color joke making fun of one of the private schools in the area that, saying that she didn't find me there <laughs> and i think they noticed that you know my accent was uh I'm going to say, Mississippi. yeah, I was going to yeah, make not a, Mississippi. a joke and say just slightly more to be not, understood. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like be, be careful. You're about to marry this accent. So just, I don't, I don't want this come back to haunt you. Oh, like you said, so, yeah. By the time this, this goes through, that, that'll have yeah. already happened. <laughs> yeah. She actually even told me she couldn't understand one of them. He, he had a very deep Southern accent. I, I could barely make coming, out what he was coming saying. from Perrin. That is a, quite the statement. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. She, but, she yeah. said she had no clue what he was saying the whole time. I think so I made out about so... a tenth of the words, but anyway, she says this, yeah, this lady state trooper is saying how she's just surprised that I knew how to change a tire and like, where did I come from? And. I was like, well, like, you know, I'm from South Dakota, live out in the country, like have kind of a little hobby farm out there that my parents have. So like, you know, I've, I've done this before basically. And oh, well, the last couple that I stopped and helped on the side of the road, the guy didn't know what he was doing. So he sat in the passenger seat and the girl was changing the tire. <laughs> that, that's, that's what I texted you. And I, I, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said something to the effect of like, what do we got to do to make sure that that doesn't happen again? <laughs> like, I'm down because, goodness gracious, no guy should be sitting in the truck while his girlfriend is trying to figure out how to change the tire. Anyway, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a little, it had a little more fire in it that my, my phone was, was kind of hot to the touch when that text came <laughs> through. And it, and it ended with something like saying, there's no way I want Perrin or my uh, future daughters or my sisters to have to sit in the truck while, excuse me, we'll be out on the side of the road while the boyfriend's sitting in the truck. And so we that kicked off a pretty interesting conversation that took place between you and I and, and several other, multiple other people in Unbound, primarily the, the men of Unbound. And we're just talking about it. And it, it, you know, on the surface, that's kind of like every guy should know how to change a tire. But then, Ken, you and I have had, had a, a much deeper conversation about that. And it wasn't about whether or not you're a man if you can change a tire. That's not at all what we were yeah. saying. And that's not what you were thinking. 
it had a lot to do with exposing somebody to hard work and danger when you were avoiding it. And the tire changing was somewhat superfluous in terms of skill. Um, it is a good thing to know how to change a tire. It's not something that we think, you know, is some sort of check car that you have to have. Um, but then that kicked off a whole discussion about what does it mean to be a man? And so can, can you follow up a little bit in some of those conversations we had and what we concluded? Yeah, I liked what you just said there about exposing somebody else to danger or hard work when you're avoiding it. And that, that really is the, the problem that I had with that. I'm totally fine. I actually teach a lot of new people at work. We get, you know, high school kids and just people that are inexperienced in the trades in at the company I work at. And generally, I'm the one tasked with kind of training them and helping them figure this stuff out. So I have no problem with people that don't know how to do that. You know, I've grown up around it a little bit more than a lot of people. So I understand that. But it, it really comes down to more. I think I said to you at one point, it's not that I want to teach guys how to change tires. Although I'm happy to do that, it has more to teach them why they should want to change the tire in the first place. So that's that's the bigger thing. And why they should want to expose themselves to the danger and hard work and be able to keep their girlfriend, wife, daughter, anyone else, et, et cetera, out of it. And I think the best way to do that, through conversations about what it means to be like a biblical to exercise biblical masculinity, I guess. And and then also, you know, after you kind of teach them why, then then you can, you know, move on to teaching them how. But I, I actually had another just very like flash moment conversation with Perrin about this. Just the other day, we were we were in a movie theater and by the like it, on the you know on the previews it it said something about like, you know, detect like take a moment to see where the nearest exit is in case of emergency and i said something to her i'm like i, I don't remember how it came up but like you know what kind of emergency are they talking about and she was like oh i don't know maybe if like somebody goes to shoot up the place and i made a comment like well i'm not exiting at that point that's what i got a gun for and she's like well you should get out if you can i'm like no you should get out if you can but that's not what i'm here for right and you know that didn't happen, but you know, those things have happened. And it's, it's interesting hearing testimony from people who have been in those very extreme situations about like what's going through their head when they're making the decision to do what every other person thinks is the illogical move. Yeah. Well, I think that what was interesting is it kicked off a multi-month. In fact, we're still kind of in, in, in some of this conversation because I think you and I both and several other people that we talked to, David, I think you and I were talking about this at various times as well is that, you know, when you use the words biblical masculinity, it sets off all kinds of alarm bells and people get all freaked out and they think about various things. But there's that's not entirely irrational because it often comes with some sort of masculine stereotype. And and I think that, Ken, you and I have talked about this. We do generally think it is a good thing to be able to do things like change tires and all those kinds of things. And I just say that's an objectively good thing. But... It's interesting when I say that, I don't mean that I think that everybody ought to do it. And I don't think that your ability to do that particular set of skills or not is in at all reflective of your masculinity. And so we had an interesting conversation. My son and I were talking about this, Caleb, who's in the program and, and Kean's age and, and kind of was in this whole conversation. And he had what I thought was a really helpful insight when he said, well, he says, because we were talking about how we would help train young men to do a better job of understanding what it means to, to be a man and to, and to carry out those responsibilities. And, and Caleb said, he said, well, first of all, we have to start with this. He said, my goal isn't to become more of a man. My goal is to become more like Christ. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I'm not trying to become some stereotypical man or even archetypical man, ar archetypical man. Like in other words, there, there's not some sort of ideal masculine man out there that I'm trying to become unless that's Christ. But he said, but we're all to become more like Christ. And he said, however, it is true that we were made male and female. And so we are then called to express that in some different ways. Well, that was interesting. It kind of set us back to some more basic things. And it kind of also got us off this side thing where it's like, okay, well, we clearly need to have a retreat where we teach everybody how to dig fence posts and change tires, which is what we, we were all discussing and saying, that's not at all what we're trying to get at. And then we circled around and said, okay, well, how is that expressed? And one of the things that we've been playing with a lot recently is that at some level, it's expressed with a what we've t uh, titled it as a first responsibility. 
And, and we have to say it carefully because it's not that like other people are responsible and, and we're not saying that women aren't responsible or, or can't be responsible. That's, that's not what we're saying at all. But instead, there is this idea of a, of a first responsibility. And, uh, and this was also colored by, we do some training for our Ascend team leaders and Victoria uh, Shorter does that training and she uses as one of the textbooks for that. Oh, the Jocko Extreme Willard, ownership. Extreme ownership. <laughs> I just had to do a complete blank. I was like, what's the name of that? Extreme ownership. And, and, you know, in that, Jocko talks about the fact that, it, you know, whatever happens, it's your responsibility. And, and to me, that is more close to what we were trying to say is that there's a, we, we, we titled it a first responsibility. And so to your point, Kian, if something goes wrong in the movie theater, it's, it's inherent on you that your first responsibility is to try to confront evil. And, and that supersedes. And that's, that's your first kind of reaction. And so, I don't know, th th talk a little bit about, because we had some discussions about that. And David, feel free to jump in too, because I think we've all three of us have, have at various times sort of chipped away at this idea a bit. Well, I think to clarify just real quick, the, the idea of the tire change and how that kind of fits into this is that it's not as much that knowing how to change a tire is a masculine thing, but knowing how to care for something that you own and like how to like maintain and care for the things that you own. That I think is a masculine concept. And I think it's a biblically masculine concept for like, hey, we have been like given responsibility for something. Therefore, we should know how to take care of something. And that can look front like anything from like that applies to so many areas of our life. Anything from changing, taking care of our uh, our cars to our homes to uh, our loved ones is that like taking care for and like in a sense, like maintaining and nurturing is something that we are called to do. And so I think that's kind of the piece where I see that as being a masculine thing. Well, there's this idea of stewardship that I think comes into that, that, you know, mm -hmm. for the very first Genesis account, it's like you're to steward this, these resources you're giving us. So therefore things that need to be fixed. And if you live in a world that is fallen, there's always going to be things that need to be fixed is inherently a masculine responsibility. However, it's worth noting that all kinds of things need fixed. Tires need fixed. Bad ideas need fixed. Bad music needs fixed. <laughs> you know, bad art needs fixed. Bad videos, bad movies need fixed. There's, there's a, I would say, an infinite amount of ways that that can be expressed. And it's not limited to things that involve tools or something like that. But it is, it is comprehensive in the sense that, you know, things that are broken, there's a responsibility to fix those. And at some level, part of being male is to save that as a first responsibility. We kind of wound up with that sort of responsibility thing, but we started first with sort of seeing this as a mythology. And so you've had some interesting observations of, it's a cool thing now to talk about toxic masculinity. And I think that that is maybe an overexpression of, of chauvinism or of strength and all those kinds of things. And we could get into those weeds a little bit, but I think you've been exposed to some toxic, max, toxic masculinity, just in the sense of watching people and saying, you are deliberately shirking responsibility there. You know what I mean? And so, so speak a little bit to that. Yeah. I mean, I see it all the time in the trades. Sometimes I'm guilty of it, but for those of you who aren't in the trades, most guys that you meet in the trades are what you stereotype is like a manly man. They, they're all, you know, tossed and tattered up and whatever that, that, you know, some of them are really nice guys. Some of them less so. But I, a common one that I see is, especially when like generaling a project and you've got subs that always want to blame everything, every problem on the last guy that was in there, that that can kind of get on my nerves sometimes. And like I said, I can be guilty of it too. But, you know, you end up with your electrician in there and he's mad at the plumber because the plumber put his junk where the electrician needs to put theirs and things like that. So I, I'd say that can be, you know, some toxic masculinity because sometimes that ends up in cussing matches and occasionally fist fights, but not, not too often. <laughs> Let me reverse it a little bit because you said something kind of interesting here a minute ago where you said that this happens and I'm guilty of it as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's an interesting, I don't think you were attempting to do that. If you were kudos to you, but it was an interesting sort of example of accepting responsibility. I mean, you're saying like, here, mm -hmm. I'm seeing this problem. And yet I'm a part of that problem. Well, that's true for all of us. You know, from a Christian worldview, we see the problem and we are part of the problem. You know, we, we know what we should do and then we don't do what we ought to do. So maybe a little bit of introspection on your part. Why? 
why did why did you add that last part? Why did what 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 was it in your background or training or life experience that put you in a position where you observed correctly? Hey, the plumber's upset and the electrician's upset, and they're all saying it's because of somebody else's fault. But simultaneously, you said, "I do that too," because it's it's the it's the realization and it's the uh, confession of "I do that too." that is both interesting and also, I think, a, a phenomenal example of accepting responsibility, which is kind of what we were talking about here. So why why is that key? Where did that come from? Well, I mean, I guess it just comes from my, like, I don't, I don't want to throw uh, shade on somebody else when I, I know that I'm part of it. Like, you know, some, some coworker of mine might watch this video and be like, oh, he's going to say, you know, give some example of me being annoyed with the last guy and he did it last week and he's not wrong. So I, I, I guess I don't, I don't know where else to say that that came from, but it's, it's just well, kind of how it is. <laughs> it's just the truth. I mean, that, that's true. And, and we can say that on our own, there's a, there's a level of, you know, every once in a while you get this kind of commentary that, you know, always that place is full of hypocrites. And I'm like, Oh, do you mean it was full of humans? I, yeah. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're synonymous. I, I mean, all of us are hypocritical to some extent. I, I tell my children to do something and then I turn around and do the same thing or yeah. not to do something and I do the same thing at, at some very level, right? And so, so yeah, so maybe it's a self-defense ploy so your coworkers don't listen to this and throw it in your face. And yet there's an awareness of that. Was that, you know, do, if, you, if you think about that a little bit, is that because you got burned by doing it the wrong way? Is that because you inferred that this is, you know, through your reading and learning, this is a good way to do it? Was it because of, you know, the way you were raised or what, what is it that gave you that awareness? Do you think, what is it that puts you in a position that you looked at that state trooper and said, what, what? I, I can't imagine. I think your and I's conversation was, okay. it was unimaginable to you. You just couldn't fathom sitting in that car and letting Perrin change the tire. Like that was yeah. just beyond, it was easier for you to imagine the sun not coming up tomorrow than for that to, to take place. Why is that? Well, I think the the biggest thing for that is, I mean, probably like hats off to my family just the way i was raised like i i've never in you know my family my like local communities and friend groups and just anywhere that i've spent much time in, anywhere that's influenced my worldview the bible it's it's always just been a, a thing that like you're the guy in the situation you take care of them the problem if it comes up you know if, if you need help you need help but like you you front that right and so i guess it's it's just really you know the, the hard part for me to imagine there isn't that a guy doesn't know how to change a tire like everybody has to learn that at some point right and i mean plenty of people are going to go through their whole life not knowing how to and that's not not the bigger the big issue here but the, the bigger thing for me was that I heard, you know, this state trooper say the guy was sitting in the passenger seat while his girlfriend is now jacking up more weight because of his useless weight sitting in the car. It's like, it, at minimum, like, get out there and start reading an instruction manual, look up a YouTube video on it, something like try to help, try to be a productive part to the puzzle. Not just don't just go sit in your car and scroll Instagram or whatever. You know that 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 was the biggest part for me of the awareness of like that's not how that should be. And then also to your point of the awareness of where it comes in that like I'm guilty of these things too is I'd say the biggest one is when reading the Bible you get to read all kinds of things that are like this is how it should be and these are all the ways that I fall short in it. So. Yeah, I think, you know, just, just worldview really is what it comes down to. And, you know, in, in my case and you guys' case, a, a biblical worldview. Worldview is certainly part of it. I think you also talked about a, a culture. You, you know, there's there's a sort of a, I think what's interesting is you're struggling here because I think at some level you're like, I don't know. Like, it was, it was like, why, why would I not know this? I, I mean, there wasn't yeah. kind of like, you're not pointing to like, oh, aha, I read this and I was like, oh, that's me. It was more like, no, this is the examples. This is what I was taught. This is, yep. there's almost never been a time, you know, my, my guess is if seven-year-old Kean had been in a car that broke down, if, you know, hadn't gotten in trouble for mom, you'd have been out 
reading the instruction manual, passing over the tools or doing something, right? I mean, because that would have yep. been the expectation. <laughs> have and memories so there's, there's of that a, happening. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a cultural expectation that comes with it. So it's a worldview, but it's also a culture that that supports that and teaches that. That brings up a good point too. Just with like community and culture, like I, I think it's super undervalued and actually i also think this is a, a point of like biblical masculinity that can get overlooked and turned toxic in in some regard community is a is a huge thing and being in a culture in a community like with people that are good i guess is the the best way to say it you know i i've got my buddies here that are going to be my groomsmen in a few days um together you know we've spent countless hours together since middle school and i can honestly say like the aspect of like iron sharpening iron between us is incredible and looking back to conversations we even had at like 13 14 years old seeing how that's like developed over time and you know if, if you look in like the bible i actually thought uh, another podcast uh, interview with john lovell i think he was interviewing lucas botkin and this kind of came up with having good male friends is is a is a big deal and it gets overlooked because guys like to be self-sufficient and i think we should know how to be we should also know that collectively we're stronger than we are together assuming we can communicate decently efficiently <laughs> but yeah like paul look at paul he was single his whole life but he had strong friends that that were there to back him up and his culture and worldview clearly influenced the rest of human history in a positive way too. Well, there's that, you talk about male friendships and being where they step up for responsibility and even uh, you've alluded to a touch of violence here with your electrician and, and plumber friends and stuff. And so, so I think I can wrap this all up as we close this, the story that also involves Key and it was, it is one of my favorite memories just because it was something that actually happened, but it just kind of plays into this last year. We had another unbound wedding that we were attending and we were all there. And it just so happened that I didn't have anything to do, but I noticed that, that we were at a church that had about 28 outside doors and people like 27 of those outside doors were locked and it wasn't really clear which door you were supposed to come in. So I thought, well, I'd make myself useful by just going out and waving to people that came in the parking lot and opening the door. So I was opening the door and people were coming in the church. And so I opened the door and Kean and Trent, who works for us, and Donnie, Trent's brother, uh, all came in. And so just to set the picture, we're talking about three very fit young men in really good looking suits, all wearing sunglasses at the particular time. And they all had just gone to the door. The line was backed up. So when I pushed the door shut, because it was a little cold that day, I literally pushed Kean in the building as I kind of shoved the door shut on him, right? And so I'm standing up in this little stoop and a guy comes up the walk. He's not dressed for a wedding. He's dressed in kind of ratty jeans and terrible sneakers and, and kind of a t-shirt. And he said, I'm here for the wedding. And you know, I don't know everybody that's coming to the wedding, so I don't want to accidentally throw out somebody's relative. And so I was like, cool. Do you have an invitation? And he goes, oh, no, nah, man, I'm just going to come and sit. And I was like, well, you can't get into the wedding without an invitation. And he's like, oh, you're going to be like that? And he got kind of, I, I could tell that he was getting pretty tense. And I was like, yeah, you can't. If, if, if you don't know anybody, if you don't know the bride and groom and you're not invited, you, you can't come in there. And he's like, I'm, I'm just going to come in and sit in the back. And I said, no, you're not. And, and he kind of spread his feet a little bit and he kind of, he hunched down, which if you guys know, is, is, is kind of the prelude to getting ready to, to throw a punch or do something. And this is where things get weird because I immediately have this thought as like, my hand is on a doorknob and all I've got to do is extend my left arm and the door is going to open and Trent and Donnie and Kean are going to be standing on the side and I'm just going to be like, get them boys. And they're going to think it's the best day they ever had. And they'll have the high ground because it was like two steps up off the ground, right? So when he kind of tensed and went down a little bit, I started to laugh. I like literally just started to chuckle to myself, which totally flipped him out. And so he kind of, he kind of blinked and he stepped back and he's like, okay, fine. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Be like that. And then he just started talking to us. And he's like, okay, whatever, whatever, man, whatever. And he just walked away. And, and so he just stomped on the street and I'm just sitting there laughing, going, that was going to be the best unbound wedding story ever. Like it was just going to be super funny, you know? And so anyhow, that turned out to be close to the end of the, the guests coming in. So I closed the door. The wedding was beautiful. And I'm at the reception and I cut up to Key and Donnie and Trent. I told them the story. And Key and do you remember the first words out of your mouth? He's like, oh man, I wish you'd open the door. <laughs> but 
But so it's a funny story, but there's also some interesting stuff there, right? I mean, in terms of friendship, I, it was funny to me. What it made me laugh was like, I, I, they won't even need any warning. I'm going to open the door and I'm just going to say, get him. And then th there's no way this guy's going in the building. There's no way I'm going to have a problem. There's no way that this doesn't get taken care of. And, and just to have that kind of reliance and to know that people that you know would respond instantly to a situation with a problem and, and would do that no matter what it takes. That's uh, a pretty cool definition of manhood to some extent. And it's also a pretty cool way to live your life when you're surrounded by people that you know would instantly spring into action like that. And um, I think there's a, a mission there for us to cultivate that kind of worldview, but also to build the kind of cultures that produce people that would serve others and that would step into the breach in those kinds of ways. It's funny that you mentioned this because the, like you said, with, you know, having friends that are like willing to spring into action for you, I've, I've been thinking a lot about it lately, I guess, just with weddings coming up. One of my good friends is getting married in August and, you know, I'm getting married in a few days. He's going to be in my wedding. And it's just kind of, we, you know, went out and hung out for a, a day and just kind of chatted and shot some guns and whatnot. And it, it made me think about all the years that like we've had together and all some of the interesting things that our friend group has kind of gone through together. And you know, simultaneously amongst the last couple of weeks of thinking all, about all of this, I've also been, uh, well, y y you've turned me on to one of the shows, the Dirty Civilian YouTube channel, you know, hearing a little bit about, from them and other like kind of prepper people and just hearing people that talk about whatever their, their like end of the world plan is, which I don't, I don't get super into, but it's, it's always funny to me to hear it because all these people are talking about what they're going to do in the end of the world. And it all like kind of revolves around how they're going to like hunker down and survive. And I'm thinking, how, why, like, who's going to help you? Like, yeah, you might have like a wife and a couple kids or something, but like, if that's all you've got, like, where does that, where does that work? You know, that, that, and also just like this is a total different tangent, but like watching guys on like Instagram reels or YouTube shorts, thinking that they can like clear a room by themselves. And I'm like, you're, you're going to die in like 30 seconds if you try that in the real world. But yeah, friends are a big asset and people overlook that a lot, I think. So have them, have friends, have good ones, that you know, you can rely on. <laughs> Well, building that community, we've had this discussion about the prepper thing, and I always tell people, I, I, if the end of the world comes, I'm going to be fine. And I know that because of last weekend. And they said, well, what happened last weekend? I said, well, last weekend I got 11 and a half tons of gravel delivered to put into, I have a, I have a three-sided building outside of my house that has been just a mess. And so it was kind of muddy and nasty underneath it. So we put this, we're going to spread all this gravel out on it. And so I had a dump there and, you know, my way of moving 11 and a half tons of gravel was with a shovel and a wheelbarrow and it was dumped right in front of the building. So we're talking about, you know, a couple hours hard labor, but it's going to get done. And my neighbor drove by it. He's like, what the bleep are you doing? And I was like, I'm moving gravel. He's like, with a wheelbarrow and a shovel? Why are you doing that? And I was like, because I have a wheelbarrow and a shovel. And he's like, I have a tractor that is not being used. And I was like, yeah. And I'm thinking, but you know, you don't ask to borrow stuff that's not yours, right? And he looks at me and just rolls his eyes. And so he drives up and I actually had to finish doing that. So I stopped and I was going to do some mowing. And then about 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, he comes driving out to me on his gator as I'm mowing. And he said, the tractor is in front of your building and I just showed your son how to use it. Don't ever let me catch you using a wheelbarrow and shovel to move gravel again. And, and so, yeah, and, and using his tractor with a front end loader, it took me less than half an hour to spread 11 and a half tons of gravel. It was much easier, but that's my prepper work. Yeah. Right. I don't have five years worth of food and I don't have all the kind of prepper things, but I have a community that things go bad. The first thing that happens, we'd all get together and be like, okay, what do we got to do? Like, how, exactly. how are we going to, how are we going to work together to get through this? And not only is that important to survive, it's important to have something to survive for. <laughs> you know, I don't yeah, want to be in a, sure. a post-apocalyptic world where I'm all by myself and I'm taking care of me and mine. And uh, we close the door on everybody else. Not only is that an anti-Christian idea, it's also probably not going to be a very fun world to live in. And I would bet that you've got, you know, you said, you know, that you'll be fine because of last weekend. I would bet that on any given day, you could say that exact sentence and have an example to point to because you have community and it's, right. yeah, kind of makes me think of like my, my best friend, Jason out here. He's an auto 
architect and a really good one, and I am not. So I'm a carpenter, and he's okay with carpentry, but sometimes needs help. And we've had this interesting thing. He, he bought a house about a year ago. And so for uh, quite a while there, I needed a lot of vehicle work, and he needed a lot of housework. And there was all a lot of, you know, trading work that went back and forth there. And I, I thought about that, and I was like, how much money did we, like, save each other there? If, you know, if, if I would have been taking my truck to a shop and he would have been hiring a carpenter, like, and, you know, there's plenty of examples like that. But, yeah, community is amazing. You need it. More than well, ammo. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that that, that if, you're, if you're looking for a title, community is important. You need it. Friends, get some. You need a more yes. ammo. So absolutely, there's Thank some you. words of wisdom right there. I'll co-sign there's, that. Yes. <laughs> David's getting jealous over here. Kian stole the words of wisdom line. So. Well, Kian, thank you so much for being willing to come on and let us interrogate you on this. We are praying for you, wishing all blessings. We talked earlier about the fact that, that I won't be able to join you for the wedding, but we'll look forward to entertaining you in Paris when you swing south at some point in the future. And hey, who knows? I've been in South Dakota a whole lot more than I expected recently. And I now know I can fly into Omaha and get a ride. And so yeah, there's all kinds absolutely. of possibilities that are open. So thanks, man. Take care. Thank you. Well, David, we were just joking and said, once we got them wound up, we knew Kean would keep going. And we've had some really fun conversations with Kean over the years in a lot of different places as he's been an Unbound student. And then like often happens, we see them at events and then we see them at other events. And then we see them at things that are not official Unbound events, like just recently when we were all together for the wedding. And it's been a, it's been a fun ride. And it was a fun conversation. When, when you first meet Kian in person, he is not somebody who you would expect to be the best person that you could ask for to have like a really in-depth conversation about responsibility and masculinity and community. He, he just comes off as just a very unassuming South Dakota native who drives a pickup truck that's uh, probably worth less than uh, most of our computers. But we, but as a matter of fact, he has, yeah, absolutely been a catalyst for a lot of really great conversations in the Unbound community. And we really appreciate having him around. It's been a lot of fun. Well, there's so much that we've, you know, Kian referred to that home old phrase, kind of a tired phrase in a lot of Christian communities now, but iron sharpening iron. But there is an aspect of that. There's ideas that I've had before that, you know, talking to Kian have sharpened those. Sometimes I've rejected some, sometimes picked up others. And I've been fascinated with Kian's willingness to engage and keep changing. And so, you know, Kian's not the same person that we met three years ago. And that's often the case. And we often meet folks who are in that category that they're young people just starting to step out into the adult world. And, and there's a lot of changes that happen. And that's true for Kian. And that's not to say, you know, he was an extraordinary in many ways, extraordinary young man when he came into the program. And yet he's a very different person from where he was then. And so watching that growth and then being able to, to, to not just watch it, but to participate in it, because we would say that we're not the same people either. And, ha and mm -hmm. part of the reason that we're not is because we met Kian and learned from him and, and had these conversations and done these discussions. So, you know, I think just the big takeaway for me, David, is that Kian will joke around about clearing rooms and doing all those kinds of things. And yet he's not confused when it comes down to it. You know, his kind of funny line there, friends are better than ammo. And, and, and we have that saying in Unbound that time and tasks only make sense in the context of relationships. In other words, what you do and how you use your time only makes sense in the context of how that relates to people. And that is a, a core value. That's one that Kian had before he got to us, but it's one he's helped us to reinforce. And that's a fun conversation. We hope you enjoy as much as we do. Well, it's coming down into the summer, and that means we're coming down to the last bits of summer as we're getting ready to prepare for the end of summer, which for us is the beginning of the unbound year. And so we were on a, I was on, I don't know about you, David, I was on a series of meetings today as we're starting to put what is now starting the beginning of the finishing touches for our big national conference apex. Mm -hmm. And those are ranging from the really exciting ones, we're down to it, and then always there's a couple of those like, eh. We need to get this done before this happens. And we've got a f not, not too many. We've got a few of those still running around. So that means if you're listening to this, when this airs, that there's only a few weeks left to still enroll in the Ascent class. And, you know, I'm not sure if there's much to say other than if the ideas about community that we discussed make sense to you, if the kind of community things that we were discussing with Kian resonate with you, or if you're looking for that kind of community, I know where you can find one. And you can check out the Ascent, the Unbound website, unbound.us to learn about our Ascend program, 
depending on when you listen to this, there's a webinar series that we have going. We just did the first one last night. We had it maxed out, I think, for the first time our webinar mm -hmm. platform in terms of registration. So that was very exciting. That recording is available. And so if you want to check that out, you can find out information about that. And we would look forward to welcoming you at Apex and into a, a grand community. And, and in just a few short years, you'll be sitting on perhaps this podcast talking about a bunch of stories related to events and friends and connections that you made through Unbound. And so check us out at beunbound.us. David, I'll let you have the closing words. I would just tag on to that, that it's been so cool to be a part of the Unbound community for so many years. And I don't think that we have ever had anyone or will have anyone exactly like Kian ever again. But I also don't think that if you're listening to this and you're interested in the ESM program, I don't think that we would or will ever have anybody exactly like you either. And that is what makes what we do so cool is that we get to get people into the community from all different walks of life and all different sets of interests and backgrounds and perspectives. And it all just melds together into a common purpose of looking for what it means to thrive and serve the kingdom of God. And yeah, just we're so excited to be able to facilitate that. And yeah, if you think that's something that you or your student is interested in, definitely check us out. Until next time, be unbound. Be unbound.